taking a deep breath in, we breathe in peace. And we exhale love coming into this beautiful moment. And for those of you listening at home, I want to apologize in advance because I have been hearing um, from some of you that we have been having some microphone issues. So at some point we will be getting a new microphone. Um, but in the meantime, if it kind of goes in and out, same with the video, we do apologize. <clears throat> Hopefully it's still not a word, but listenable. Hopefully it's still listenable. <laughs> <laughs> So let's take a breath and reground ourselves. Beautiful. So we're on mastery of thought, which is the second tenet from living peace. And last week we covered master of impulse. So for those of you who may have missed it, you're welcome to go on our YouTube channel and then uh, rewatch that or watch it for the first time. But what's cool is, so we have the book living peace and now I'm currently working on living earth. So living peace is pretty much pure philosophy and a lot of psychology, living earth as in a lot of the spirituality. And it actually is going to have the nine uh, Dunusha precepts. So in this, we have the nine living peace tenets. And over time, once you really practice them, they actually become precepts that when you go from brown robe to black robe, you then take a even stronger vow with these teachings. Because when you take on the brown robe, you're pretty much just saying, yeah, I like this stuff. <laughs> I'm going to really strive to embrace it. But once you really get into the embodiment of it, that's when you transition into the black robe. And so mastery of thought turns into, and for those of you who want to write this down, it turns into the consistent ability of peaceful response. So we have mastery of impulse as the embracing aspect of it and then once we really fully actualize it in our being it turns into the consistent ability of peaceful response and what i love about these nine precepts and they go much more deeper into this work is that we have the base understanding of what we're working on but it doesn't always make sense of what we're actually trying to do because when you say mastery of impulse yes it's it's kind of general what what does that exactly mean what is the main goal here and the goal is that consistent ability of peaceful response, no matter what the heck is going on in your life. And once you get to that place, then you realize you're getting into the embodiment of this tenet. And that is quite, 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 quite beautiful. And so we have nine of, I'm like, nine of these teachings, <laughs> nine of these teachings. Um, and each of them go a little bit more than what you would find in Living Peace. And that's, again, what we're working on right now in the book, Living Earth, which will probably be out either this year or next year. So it, it's some pretty cool stuff. So what does that mean, the consistent ability of peaceful response? <clears throat> Let me open up my little page real quick. We can take a breath. And this is something that we actually mentioned this past Wednesday during our Zen gathering. And if you, if you were not there, or maybe you want to write this down again, I liked this question, thinking life or living life, thinking life or living life. Am I constantly thinking about the practices? Am I constantly thinking about life or am I fully living life in the present moment and living the practice? Because if we bring it back to the practice of peaceful response in all situations, many of us are constantly, anytime something happens, we're often analyzing it, aren't we? <laughs> and the moment you analyze it, you just went into your own delusion of idea making. And so we're constantly picking apart things that, sure, thinking about it may actually help us when we're beginners. And we're getting to the point where we have to critically think about it, and then we come back with a response. But over time, the longer you do these teachings, what ends up happening is you literally just start living the practice. You're not, you're not constantly in your head of thinking what it is that I'm doing each and every day. You are so busy living your life. You don't have time constantly being stuck in your head thinking about it. Who's done that? Where it's almost like you stayed in all day long and your mind went all around the world. <laughs> but you really didn't do much of anything. <laughs> And here's the trick with the ego. That satisfies the ego. And it gives you a pat on the back saying, job well done. Because it's like, you worked hard and you were exhausted by the end of that journey around that world, all the while doing nothing. But what you were doing was you were exhausting mental energy, constantly analyzing, analyzing, thinking, thinking, playing scenario after scenario after scenario in your mind. And unfortunately, 
that's not the same thing as actual practice of going out into the world and showing up in difficult situations or even just neutral situations and maintaining that peaceful response. Uh, a fun example that I had, was it Wednesday when I cut myself and I was bleeding? Okay, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, you guys missed a fun little thing they did. So it's, it's pretty much healed now. Uh, well, kind of, it still hurts, but I sliced really deeply into my knuckle with some glass. I was, pick, I was looking for my robe and I picked up this frame and the glass slid out from it and just went into, ooh, that hurt, and went into my knuckle. And what was fascinating about that was normally we have Snow Angel in the very back room, but she could hear the commotion and she was just going wild. And she was just, she would tear apart that door if I did not let her out. And so there was all this hectic, chaotic, chaotic energy. And then I go over and grab the robe and then the, the glass falls and I slide. And literally I was bleeding so much. The whole class, the whole hour, whole two hours that we were in class, it was still bleeding. I had to keep pressure on it. But there was not any part of me that was actually triggered by it. And let me go ahead and invite you guys to write this down and this sums it up quite perfectly. This is your own little Zen koan for you. A dog barks, comma, a cut bleeds. <laughs> a dog barks a cut bleeds and that's all I was looking at it in that moment and I was able to come out here and recognize that she was barking and then we just kind of I, I found a way that could handle her and she was good for the rest of the couple of hours and then the bleeding there was no resistance to it I just wrapped it up and held it while I was teaching class and so that's the that right there is so much wisdom in it a dog barks a cut bleeds do we need to have a judgment or analysis around that Really think about that for a moment. Most of us, including me in the past, I would have been fucking pissed. <laughs> you know, I would have been upset at her for not like, we've done this so many times, but why is this different? <laughs> you know, of not being able to just calm down and do her own thing like she normally does. And then I would have been upset because normally when we stub our toe, what do we do? Ah, right? We freak out or if we get hurt, we'll cuss. And then we'll actually say, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. Why did I do that? We'll have those belittling thoughts. Or why did this have to happen? We have these resistant thoughts. And so in that beautiful energy of what could have been chaos, but I wasn't viewing it as chaos. I was just viewing it as a dog barks, a cut bleeds. It's just neutral information. But when we're in analysis and resistance to it, and we're trying to find some meaning behind it, because maybe if you're really into the new age a new age genre of law of attraction and you're taking a little too far and you're just like, what does this mean? <laughs> and you're like, what did I do today that caused this and created this? It's like, ah, that's just going to get you lost out of the present moment. And you're trying to like analyze what you did wrong earlier in the day that developed this negative karma, karmic momentum that <laughs> led to this experience rather than just saying the dog barked, the cut is bleeding. And then you walk out, you come into class with a beautiful group of people, you sit down, you hold your finger, you put pressure on it, and then you start talking. If I was in my head, I'd not be able to do that. But because we were in the present moment, it was very beautiful. And so when I was thinking of examples uh, today of what to share with them, I thinking about life or living life, that came back to me. Because really, I just never thought about it again. It was just, it is what it, what it, it was what it was. But isn't that cool? So I invite you, the next time you're getting into overanalysis of something or getting trapped in your mind, just recite that little mantra. <laughs> a dog barks, a cut bleeds. <laughs> it is the beautiful neutrality of life. And literally, you can apply that to any situation. You know, even if you're in conflict with someone in your life that you're wishing them to be different than who they are, if you literally just accepted them for who they are, it would change the scenario. But normally what keeps us in abusive relationships or abusive situations is we're not accepting it. <laughs> we're constantly trying to change it. We're constantly trying to fall in love or see the potential of it and talk someone into bettering themselves or talking ourselves into bettering ourselves. There's, there's all these scenarios that keep us in these situations, but when we fully accept the shit as the shit, we're gonna move. We're gonna step out of it. But when we're pretending that it's something else, and we're constantly justifying that, justifying our behavior, justifying someone else's behavior, doesn't work out for us that well, does it? 
Who's ever kept themselves in a relationship that justified being in it because you saw the person's potential and you knew that if they just changed this one or two or 10 or 20 or 100 qualities about themselves, then it would be a great relationship, <laughs> right? And it may not even be a romantic relationship. It could be family, it could be friends, it could be colleagues, it could be anything. If only they just did this one thing, I could see it so clearly. If they just changed, then everything would be fine. But the truth is we're not accepting them in that beautiful moment for who they actually beautifully are. And even in their chaotic expressions that may be causing harm, there is so much beauty in it because it is literally teaching us about ourselves, but we're ignoring that teaching about ourselves. And so we keep ourselves in that situation versus actually paying attention to the message that is being given. Does that make sense? Whoo, hot damn, deep breath. Didn't know I was going there, but we did. <laughs> And so what I love, and this is a quote by Shunryo Suzuki um, from his book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. He has this quote in there that says, 99% of thoughts are self-centered. 99% of our thoughts are self-centered. And that's how we know we're not in the practice because often our thoughts are always um, chewing on something external, external and how it relates to us. Chewing on something external and how it relates to us. We'll say things like, oh, I have an opinion about this, or I feel about this, or I am this, I am this, or it's just there's always an I involved in all these sentences when we're relating to some external stimulation. And what we're doing with that is we're making it about us. So it's kind of like I could have said, well, I was upset at Snow Angel for barking, and I was upset that I cut myself. But rather, you see the difference there? A, cut bleed, a dog barks, a cut bleeds. There's no I. It's just a neutral statement. But when I add my opinion and my experience on top of it, I just turned it into something else. I turned it into my own self-centered perception of that reality. And again, there's nothing wrong with doing this because we all do it constantly. But if you really wanna go deeper into Zen philosophy and inner peace teachings, learning how to neutralize all, all experiences on this planet and all experiences that we're having really does lead to inner peace. And it exceptionally helps if we're trying to hold space for someone else. Because anytime you're listening to anyone's story, often our first response is, oh, let me tell you my experience about that. Mm -hmm. And especially when someone's in grief, you know, they're, they're, they're in tears and they're crying, they're just expressing all these things. And all of a sudden you bring up the exact same thing that happened to you 10 years ago. And all of a sudden you go on this monologue about what happened to you and you're no longer listening to them or holding space for their grief. What a selfish thing to do. <laughs> We've all done it. We have all done it. And so it's really learning to take a step back from that. And rather than making it about our own experience and our own perception, we literally can just start asking, you know, what do you need in this? What, what would you like to receive in this moment? What would you like to receive in this moment? Such a powerful thing. But again, we like the feeling of relating to people. And so we love oversharing. And we do that because it's a point of relating. And I, even, I still do that. But really, we, we, when we're more mindful and we do these practices on a consistent basis, we start to learn when it is warranted and when it is not. Because sometimes it is very necessary and it helps bond people tremendously. But a lot of times, especially when someone is in grief or caught up in illusion, delusion, caught up in some type of pain, that's normally not the time to go into bonding. <laughs> and also, you might be reinforcing their own delusion because if they're caught up in their pain, who's heard the sentence, misery loves company. And so if you're feeding into their misery and through relation, that is also not necessarily helping them. And it's just reinforcing that belief system. Interesting, isn't it? And that's the fascinating thing about this work. And this is, I don't really make promises, but if you do consistently do this, you're going to notice it, that it, it, it's almost weird to say, but it is true. All the negative experiences you've had in your life, you start to see in a completely different way, and it no longer is a trigger for you. It no longer is a trigger for you. And then moving forward with any type of quote negative situations that might arise even when it comes to death and loss and some of the most painful experiences that normally most humans collapse in on themselves with it completely changes and you will still feel the pain of it but you're no longer caught up in the grief of it you're no longer consumed by the stress of it because we start to realize that literally 99 percent of our experience is self-centered ideas 
And so when you start to create a healthy separation between your own ideas about these things, you're going to suffer so much less because it is your idea about the situation at hand that causes you suffering. I've done so much grief work over the years, even mothers who've lost their children. And it's fascinating to pay attention to the mothers that are at peace with it and the mothers who are not. What is the common denominator there? The idea, the belief about the afterlife, the belief about the here life, the belief about is death a failure or is death just a natural completion of a cycle? And so depending on their ideology about how to relate to death, they have a completely different grieving experience. Isn't that fascinating? There's always the pain there. Don't get me wrong. That pain is there. And there'll always be that missing and there'll always be that sadness. But the consuming grief that completely shuts down a life. Who's had that before? The consuming grief that shuts us down from life. That is based on perception. That is based off of an idea that we have, a belief system that we have. Breathe that in. So I'm going to read a little section from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. It's kind of cool. And so you can write this quote down from Shunryu Suzuki as well, if you'd like. When you, become, when you become you, Zen becomes Zen. When you become you, Zen becomes Zen. And I'll explain that in a second after I read this paragraph. <clears throat> Zen stories or koans are very difficult to understand before you know what you are doing moment after moment. But if you know exactly what we are doing in each moment, you will not find koans so difficult. There are so many. I have often talked to you about a frog, and each time everybody laughs. But a frog is, a very interest, is very interesting. He sits just like us, too, you know. But he does not think that he is doing anything so special. When you go to a zendo and sit, you may think that you are doing something special. While your husband or wife is sleeping and you go and practice Zazen, you may feel like you're doing something special and your spouse is lazy. <laughs> that may be your understanding of Zazen, meditation. But look at the frog. A frog also sits like us, but he has no idea of Zazen. Watch him. If something annoys him, he makes a face. If something comes along to eat, he will snap it up and eat it, and he eats while he sits. Actually, that is our Zazen. Nothing special about it. Deep breath. So I love that uh, analogy with the frog, <laughs> because if you just look at a frog, it's true. Like they're not thinking that, look at me, I'm so enlightened. <laughs> you know, I'm sitting, I'm just sitting to sit. I'm in Zazen, I'm in meditation. There's no, there's no perception about that. It's just doing what it does. But the silly thing about humans or the beautiful thing about humans is that we literally can think about everything that we do on any given day. And so in all of our activities, a lot of us, not all of us, but many of us, are thinking about what we're doing. And if we're thinking about what we're doing, we're not actually fully living that experience because we're creating a, what we talked about last week, we're creating a mental overlay on top of it. We're creating a bias, an idea about something. So a lot of times when we're sitting in meditation or Zazen practice, and we have a lot of ideas come through our mind. And some of us may feel a little self-important with it, thinking that we're doing a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we'll give ourselves a pat on the back. We're like, I meditate for 20 minutes today. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I'm going to go for 21. <laughs> you know, or we'll often, this happens in relationships so much, we'll look at our spouse. That's not really doing it as much. <laughs> and then we'll have the thought, if you just did this, then you wouldn't be feeling this. And so instantly, we got into an idea about something. And we completely separated ourselves from the actual practice of Zazen, from the actual practice of being able to have that clear mind in meditation. And so my invitation to all of you is, going back to the thing that we initially said, is rather than thinking about practice, just live your practice. Rather than just thinking about life, live your life. And Zazen and meditation, mindfulness, all of these experiences can be done on a daily basis, no matter what you're doing on the planet, no matter who you're interacting with. Even if you just go for a walk and you go to the coffee shop and you get a cup of coffee, and if you drink that coffee in full presence, that's a beautiful thing. You're practicing Zazen in that moment. But guess what? If you're feeling guilty about drinking that coffee, nope. Who, I'm sure all of us can relate to this, that any type of food that we may realize that's not really healthy for us, we have a judgment about it. And then maybe we are giving into, maybe we are choosing to indulge in it 
just momentarily. And we realized that we're not going to do it 24 seven, but today we're just going to enjoy it for whatever reason. And that's okay. Well, if we have a thought about it and we feel guilty about it, you're not really going to enjoy it, are you? <laughs> but what's, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. You're fine. So you said we all are thinking about what we're doing. Yeah. And for the most part, I believe that I, I, I do it. But in my world, mm -hmm. people come to me and they're not thinking about what they're doing yeah. and they're getting into trouble yeah. and they're getting into pain <clears throat> and I'm teaching them to think about what they're doing. Yeah. So that's the exact opposite of what you're saying. I'll challenge that. Okay. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and so a lot of people that come to you are in pain, correct? Yes. And so a lot of their pain comes from their ideas, right? Yes. And so maybe they're not necessarily fully conscious of their behavior. And maybe they're not fully conscious of their behavior because they're caught up in their mind about certain things, either from the past or the guilt of the now, the pain of the now. And so they actually are thinking. Mm -hmm. And so that is the root issue of many of their issues is that they're so caught up in these victim stories, any type of story, it doesn't have to be victim, they're so caught up in the stories of their pain, their guilt, or maybe, because if you think about it, addiction, right? Mm -hmm. We'll use addiction as an example, and we numb ourselves from the pain. Yeah. But what is actually leading to it is the pain, the yeah. thinking of the pain, and so we want to shut that down. And so you see the, how, yes. isn't that cool? Well, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love it. I love it. Great question. And so let's breathe that in. So uh, it, another thing we can all write down is be like a frog. <laughs> Just be, be frog, be frog-like, be frog-esque. <laughs> and just sit to sit. I mean, some of you may have heard me say that before, just sit to sit. So difficult to do because again, we are so, our culture has programmed us to just be so caught up in the analysis, the thinking. And now we have social media. Woo! We have social media, we have anything at our fingertips if we have a smartphone and we can just log in so it doesn't have to be social media we could just browse the internet we could literally do anything on our phones now the phone is like 20 to 50 different things all in one now if not like 200 500 thousand things now thanks to all these extra apps and so anytime you open your phone it's going to encourage thought it's going to encourage thinking and so now you know based off of from 100 years ago when things were a lot more slow especially when you're in country living, you know, there was a lot more experience with nature and who's been in nature before. And isn't it interesting how the mind starts to slow down and actually join the rhythm of nature? Who's worked with animals or especially horses before the same thing happens. And so it's this beautiful thing, but now we're more plugged in more than ever. And again, I'm not saying that's bad. I think it's a beautiful thing being able to have th this much access at our fingertips. But now we are blessed with the opportunity to be distracted 24-7 without pause. I remember as a child, the TV got shut off. Like, it was just infomercials from, like, this point on. And, you know, there was really not too much anything interesting to watch. And so now, like, at 9 o'clock or even before that, literally, it shut off. There's nothing more. It was just static until the shows actually came back on in the morning. Now you can watch a show 24 seven and then you can move on to the next show 24 seven and the next show 24 seven and the next show 24 seven. So there's all these things that we can be very impulsive about. And here's tying it back to mastery of impulse. When we're always in thinking mode, it becomes so very difficult to actually respond with peace. Because when we're moving from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, we don't have a strong enough mindfulness ability to actually pause before we speak. Because we're very reactory, we're very reactionists when we don't take that time to slow down and actually get to know ourselves. Because think about it, we're going back to what uh, Shunryo said, when you become you, Zen becomes Zen. Just as the frog is the frog and it just does the frog thing, when we are not thinking about who we are and we're just doing what we're doing, then it's very easy to just respond to things. But the issue that causes our suffering that often leads to all of these difficult things later on, any type of emotion or addiction or codependency, is that we have 
all these ideas about ourselves that are often negative. We have all these ideas about other people and life that are often negative, and then we develop a negative self-certainty about things. Out of every single person I've worked with, hundreds, probably in the thousands now, over this past decade and before, a little bit before, every person suffering has been intensified 10, 50, 100 fold by their idea about themselves and by their idea about life. And so really they're not them in that moment. They're not the you and the you. Sure. <laughs> what they're doing is they're the idea about themselves and they are viewing all these other people as the idea about these people that they have but they're not actually seeing the neutrality of life as it is. They're not seeing the neutrality of themselves. Last night I was writing more of the program for the advanced students. And I'm going to, I might end with this today. We'll see. Let me see what time it is. It's a pretty cool insight. It's a very juicy insight. And it's why self-worth is not needed. And it's actually a delusion. <laughs> Read that in real quick. It will make sense. <laughs> Self-worth self, self is a very big joke because think about it. Whether you have high self-worth or low self-worth, it's both just an idea about yourself. And the issue is that you have an idea about yourself. Think about that for a moment. Your idea is always going to be subjective and it's never going to actually be fully true. So whether you have high self-worth or low self-worth, they're both just subjective ideas that you have about yourself. Some, maybe 10 years you had low self-worth and now you have high self-worth. But as you continue through these teachings and you get to the ninth tenet release self, you look in the mirror and you don't have an opinion. And that is the most freeing thing on the planet. And just realizing that I'm going to eat this food. I'm going to eat this food. I'm going to sleep and I'm going to sleep. I'm going to do my job and I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do things that interest me. I'm going to do things that interest me. I'm going to, whatever it might be, but we're always having a value on our own worth. Self-worth is a tricky thing because you are placing a value on your own identity and that will always lead you into some trouble because if you have high self-worth, chances are you might be prone to judge other people. If you have low self-worth, chances are you're prone to judge yourself. But what if you completely got rid of it altogether and you realize that it was just an idea all along and you don't actually need to have an idea of your own value? <laughs> because, in, because inherently, depending on what belief system you already have, we're either none of us are born with any value and it's all just a created thing. And so it's all cancels each other out. Or we, if you're really spiritual, you may believe in original blessing that we're already love, that we're already perfection in our imperfection. And so even in whichever direction you're taking it in, the value is unnecessary. But because we've developed culture based off of a value system, we have then created a value upon ourselves to match that culture. There is the, um, I'm going to butcher this. I'll conclude with this, but it's a really cool story. It's a Zen story or a Taoist story. <clears throat> and there is this beautiful, beautiful, giant, giant oak tree in the middle of this village, of this village square. And there was this uh, carpenter or woodcutter guy and his apprentice that came in. Um, and then the, the apprentice looked at him and said, man, that tree would bring a lot of wood. <laughs> what an awesome thing. And the master, the master woodcutter said, that tree has no value because you see how the branches are all bendy and twisty. And if, you, if I tried to make anything out of it, the, the wood would be warped. And if you try to make a boat out of it, the tree is so heavy that the boat would sink. Just all these things. He was just listing off all these things on why the wood in that tree is just it's worthless. <laughs> and the wisdom of this is that it's a beautiful thing to be worthless. Because had that tree not, then that tree would have never grown to its magnificent size and been able to shade the village and be this beautiful center point and exist. And so I just thought that was a really cool story of like, thank goodness that that tree was worthless to woodcutters because it allowed it to continue to grow and become this magnificent beast. 
<laughs> for all to enjoy. And so they're really, we have this idea of valuing ourselves and valuing other people. And unfortunately, when we're caught up in that mindset, man, we really lose the point. And it really disrupts our peace. And it changes the way in which we think about ourselves and others, and it especially changes the way in which we show up in our impulses and our reactions. Because our impulsive behavior, you can always kind of bring it back, not always, but most of the time, you can bring it back to the ideas that you have about things. And just as going back to a dog barks, a cut bleeds, I did not view not, neither of those things as bad or wrong. While old self, Alaric, would have, and that's when the judgment and the reaction would have come. But because I viewed it just as a neutral experience happening, I would say, oh, look at that, I'm bleeding. Okay, moving on. <laughs> or, oh, look at that, she's barking, she's acting up, moving on. And so how many of, the, how many of us do the alternative of having strong opinions about things and based off of our strong opinions, we react. We subconsciously have those opinions lead to instant reaction. But when you soften those, instantly it leads to more of a peaceful response. And that, my dear friends, is how mastery of thought beautifully ebbs into mastery of impulse. And the next week we're gonna talk about mastery of emotion. These three things, pretty cool, huh? So let's breathe that in. Ah, beautiful, beautiful stuff today. And so we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. And I just want to say thank you everyone at home who enjoyed or watched this video and we hope you enjoyed, but even if you did, that's okay. Even if you did not, that's okay. <laughs> and as always, feel free to subscribe, give a thumbs up or share these videos. And if, you, if anyone ever wants to donate um, and support our little Zen center here, uh, there's links down below, and you can also find my book, Living Peace, on Amazon. Thank you, and have a beautiful week.